Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters, grace and peace. <clears throat> my name is Brother Yehuda, and I'd like to say grace and peace to my brothers and born again Israelites and risen with Christ ministry. My brother Karadazar and my brother beloved. Grace and peace, my brothers. And grace and peace to all my brothers and sisters that love the gospel that Jesus Christ taught us. And love Christ and the Heavenly Father. Now, today's topic is part three in chapter six in the book of Matthews of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaching on prayer. We are here taught what to pray for and how to pray. We're going to be in the book of Matthews, chapter six, verse nine through 15. The Sermon on the Mount. After this manner, therefore pray ye. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen for if ye forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if ye forgive not men their trespasses neither will your father forgive you forgive your, your trespasses now that's in the book of matthews chapter 6 verse 9 through 15. now when christ had commended I'm sorry. Now, when Christ had condemned what it was amiss, he directed to do better for his for his of reproof of instructions, because we know not what to pray for as we ought. Christ here helps our infirmities by putting words into our mouths. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. We're going to go on the book of Matthews. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. Now, a true sum and form of all true believers' prayers, so many were the corruption that had crept into this duty of prayer among the Jews, that Christ saw it needful to give a new directory for prayer. To show his disciples what must ordinarily be the matter and method of their prayer, which he gives in words that may very well be used as a form, as the summary or content of the several particulars of our prayers. Not that we are tied up to the use of this form only or of this also, as if this were necessary to the consecrating of our other prayers we are here bid to pray after this manner with these words or to this effect that in Luke differ from this we do not find it used used by the apostles we are not here taught to pray in the name of Christ as we are afterwards we are here taught to pray that the kingdom might come which did come when the spirit was poured out Yet, without doubt, it is very good to use it as a form, and it is a pledge of the communion of saints. It is our Lord's prayer. It is of his composing and his appointing. It is very comprehensive in compassion to our infirmities in praying. The matter is choice and necessary, the method instructive, and the expression very concise. It has much in a little, and it is requisite that we acquaint ourselves with the sense and meaning of it. For it is used acceptably no further than it is used with understanding and without vain repetition. The Lord's Prayer, as indeed every prayer, is a letter sent from earth to heaven. Here is the inscription of the letter. The person to whom it is directed our father the where in heaven the content of it in several errands of request the close of thy is the kingdom the seal amen and if you will the date too this day 
Plainly, there are three parts of the prayer. The preface, our Father who art in heaven, before we come to our business, there must be a solemn address to him with whom our business lies, our Father, intimidating, int, in, intimating that we must pray not only alone and, and for ourselves, but with and for others, for we are members one of another and are called into fellowship with each other. We are here taught to whom to pray, to God only and not to saints and angels, for they are ignorant of us, are not to have the high honors we give in prayer, nor can can give favor we, ex, we expect. We are, we are taught how to address ourselves to God and what title to give him, that which speaks him rather beneficent than magnificent. For we are to come boldly to the throne of grace. We must address ourselves to him as our father and must call him so. He is a common father to all mankind by creation. We're going to go into the book of Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. Have we not all one father? Have not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? That's in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 10. Now the prophet accuses the ingratitude of the Jews towards God and man, for seeing they were all born of one father, Abraham, as God had elected them to be his holy people. They ought neither to offend God nor their brethren, by which they had bound themselves to God to be a holy people. We're going to go in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of, we're going to go in the book of Acts chapter 17, <clears throat> chapter 17 verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poet and said, have said, for we are also his offspring. That's in the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 28. God is in a special manner a father to the saints by adoption and regeneration. We're going to go in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That's in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Another planner exposition of the e efficient cause and also of eternal election by which God is said to have chosen us in Christ. That is because it pleased him to appoint us when we were not yet born, whom have, whom he would, ha would make to be his children by Jesus Christ, so that there is no reason for our election to be looked for here, except in the free mercy of God, and neither is faith which God foresaw the cause of our predestination, but the effect. So in other words, there's no reason to worry about why you're here. You're already predestined. If you're here, you're supposed to be here. You're predestined to be here. So what your what your your job is to do is get to know your God, get to know your Father, your Heavenly Father. Get to know Christ. And by doing that, you get to know Christ, have a communion with Christ. This way, you have communion with the Father. Understand it. Put on Christ. Understand. Study in the Gospel. Study in the Word of God. This is how. This is your job and your duty as you are on this earth. Everyone's duty is that. Should learn the gospel. Should learn who their heavenly father is. Who their creator is. As opposed to this way you won't be worried. You won't be stressed out. You won't be depressed. You won't be going around um, in delusion. Wondering what's going on. Why I'm here. I'm angry. I want to do this. You understand. You have better understanding. Because the gospel teaches you everything. Through Jesus Christ. Now, God respects nothing, either anything that is present or anything that is to come, but himself only. So God is no respect to persons. He's not going to because you you was a, a good lawyer or you was a good doctor or you was a good teacher or you was a good this and that. But your heart is full of malice and malicious. He's no respect to persons. So he judge everybody justly. We're going to go in the book of Galatians, chapter four, verse six. And because ye are sons, 
God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 6. Now God shows that we are free and sent at liberty to su in such a way that in the meantime, we must be governed by the spirit of Christ, who while reigning in our hearts may teach us the true service of the Father. But this is not to serve, but rather to enjoy true liberty as it is fit for sons of heirs. So in other words, we got the liberty. So we don't need, we don't need to be protesting. No justice, no peace. The, the, the sign should be no Jesus, no peace. Because without Christ, you have no peace. Because Christ is the peacemaker. So with no Jesus, no peace, that should be the same. No justice, no... Man is not going to give you justice. Man is going to always think the way they want to think. They want you to think on their terms. So if you're not thinking on their terms, you don't get no peace. Christ is just. He's just like his father. He's just with us, with his people. He's going to rule everything justly. You're not just. You're only justified by faith. Not by the works of the Lord. Not by your works. Not because you're doing this and doing that. I did this. I was protesting. I was trying to fight for the people. So I should have a spot in the kingdom no that's not how it works you have to be loving love that neighbor. you got to go by what the what the gospel says love that neighbor as you love yourself love your enemies and don't hate them and don't curse them this is how you get to the, the king this is the key but that which follows he gathers that which went before or if we have his spirit we are his sons and if we are his sons then we are free the holy spirit who is both no Jesus, no peace. The Holy Spirit, who is both of the Father and of the Son. But there is a special reason why he is called the Spirit of the Son. That is because the Holy Spirit seals up all, seals up our adoption in Christ and gives us a full assurance of it and an unspeakable privilege in it. It is. We must eye God as our Father in prayer. Keep up good thoughts of God, such as our in encouraging and not a frightened, nothing more pleasing to God, nor pleasant to ourselves, than, than to call God Father, Christ in prayer, most call, mostly called God Father. If he be our Father, he will pity us under our weakness and infirmities. We're going to go in the book of Psalm, chapter one, 103, verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Yes, you have to fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom right there. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Because if you fear God, you do right. We know the people that's running out here without just doing whatever they want to do. They have no fear of God, no image. So they running around here just doing whatever they want to do until the time comes when the truth be told. And we'll spare, God will spare us. We're going to go to the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 17. And they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. That's in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 17. Meaning, when God will restore his church according to God's promise, we will be as God's own proper goods. Meaning that is forgive our sins and govern us with God's spirit, which will make the best of our performances, though very defective, will deny us nothing that is good for us. We're going to go in the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 11 through 13. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he will he give him a stone or if he asks a fish? Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If the if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That's in the book of Luke, chapter eleven, verse eleven through thirteen. We have access with boldness to him as to a father and have an advocate with the father and the spirit of adoption when we come repenting of our sins we must eye god as a father as the protocol did 
We're going to go in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. That's in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 18. Against God, because he is said to dwell in heaven. When we come begging for grace and peace and the inheritance and blessings of sons, it is an encouragement that we come to God, not as an unreconciled, avenging judge, but as a loving, gracious, reconciled father in Christ. We're going to go on the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 19. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, thou shalt call me my father and shalt not turn away from me. That's in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 19. Now we're going to go on the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry to me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth. Now, now he shows that the wicked in their misery will cry to God and use outward prayers as the godly do. But because they do not turn from their evil, they are not heard. We're going to go in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 3 and 4. Wherefore have we fasted, said, said they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we aff afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fa fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and, and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day. To make your voice to be heard on high. Now that's in the book of Isaiah chapter 58 verse 3 and 4. As our father in heaven, so in heaven as to be everywhere else. For the heaven cannot contain him yet. So in heaven as there is there to manifest his glory. For it is God's throne. We're going to go in the book of Psalm chapter 103 verse 19. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rule over over all that's in the book of psalms chapter 103 verse 19 and it is to believers a throne of grace therefore we must direct our prayers for christ the mediator is now in heaven we're going to go in the book of hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And we all know who that is. Who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, Christ himself. That's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 1. He briefly repeats that to which all these things are to be referred. That is, that we have another high priest than those Levitical high priests. That was in the Moses days. There's a higher priest, which is Christ. That's the only priest you need. Go to Christ. He'll give you all the answers. He'll help you. He's the mediator. He's here for you. He'll take your burdens. And such a one as sit at the right hand of the Most High, God in heaven. Heaven is out of sight in the world of spirit. Therefore, our converse with God in prayer must be spiritual. It is on high. Therefore, in prayer, we must be raised above the world and lift up our hearts we're going to go on the book of psalm chapter 5 verse 1 to the chief musicians upon netholin a psalm of david give ear to my my words O lord consider my meditation that's in the book of psalm chapter 5 verse 1 heaven is a place of perfect purity and we must therefore lift up pure hands must study to sanctify God's name, who is the Holy One and dwells in that holy place. We're going to go in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh, nigh me, near me. And before all the people I will be glorified, 
and Aaron held his peace. That's in the book of Leviticus chapter 10 verse 3. Meaning God will punish those that serve God in other ways than what God has commanded. Not sparing the chief that the people may fear and praise God's judgment. From heaven God beholds the children of men. Now we're going to go on the book of Psalm chapter 33 verse 13 and 14. The Lord looketh from heaven he beholds all the sons of men. In other words, he reproves that all things are governed by God's providence and not by fortune. We're going to go into, now we're going to read Psalm chapter 33 and 14. From the place of his habitation, he looked upon all the inhabitants of the earth. That's in the book of Psalm chapter 33, verse 14, which I just read. Psalms 33, chapter chapter 33 verse 13 and 14 and we must in prayer see God's eye upon us since he has a full and clear view of all our wants and burdens and desires and all our infirmities it is the firmament firmament of his power likewise as well as of his prospect we're going to go in the book of Psalm chapter 150 verse 1 praise ye Lord Praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, meaning that is in the heavens, praise him in the heavens on high. For his wonderful power appears in the firmament, which is, which in Hebrew is called a stretching out or spreading aboard in which the mighty work of God shines. He is not only as a father able to help us, able to do great things for us more than we can ask or think. He has wherewith to supply our needs forever good. Every good gift is from above. Every, I'm sorry. Every good gift is from above. He is a father and therefore we may come to him with boldness. But a father in heaven and therefore we must come with reference. We're going to go on the book of Ecclesiastic, chapter 5, verse 2. But be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy word, words be few. That's in the book of Ecclesiastic, chapter 5, verse 2. Either in vowing or in praying, meaning that we should use all reference towards God. God hears us not for the sake of our many words or often repetition, but considers our faith and servant mind. All our prayers should correspond with that which is our great aim as true believers, and that is to be with God in heaven. God in, at God in heaven and end of our whole conversation must be particularly I in every prayer. There is the center to which we are all tending. By prayer, we stand before us there where we profess to be going. The petition and those are six, the three first relating more immediately to God and his honor. The three last to our own concern, both temporal and spiritual, as in the Ten Commandments. The four first teach, the four first teach us our duty towards God. And the last six our duties towards our neighbor. The method of his prayer teaches us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then to hope that other things shall be added. Hallowed be thy name. It is the same word that is that is all others that in other places is translated sanctified. But here the old word hallowed is retained only because people were used used to it. In the Lord's Prayer. In these words, we give glory to God. It may be taken not as a petition, but as an adoration, as that the Lord be magnified or glorified. For God's holiness is the greatness and glory of all his perfection. We must begin our prayer with praising God, and it is very fit he should be first served and that we should give glory to God before we expect to receive mercy and grace from him. Let him have praise to his perfection, and then let us have the benefit of them. 
we fix our our end and it is the right end to be aimed at and ought to be our chief and ultimate end in all our petitions that God may be glorified. All our other requests must be in sub, sub, subordination to this and in pursuance of it. Father, glorify thyself in giving me my daily bread and pardoning my sins. Since all is of God and through God, all must be to him and for him. In prayer, our thoughts and affection should be carried out most to the glory of God. The Pharisees made their own name the chief end of their prayer. We're going to go into the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayer, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Rarely I say unto you, they have their reward. Meaning, he rebukes to revoking false in prayer, ambition and vain babbling, to be seen of men in a opposition to which we are directed to make the name of God our chief end. Let all our petitions center in this and be regulated by it. Do so and so for me, for the glory of thy name, and as for as is for the glory of it. We desire and pray that the name of God, that is God himself, in all that whereby he has made himself known may be sanctified and glorified both by us and others and especially by himself <clears throat> father let thy name be glorified as a father and a father in heaven glorify thy goodness and thy highness thy majesty and mercy let thy name be sanctified for it is a holy name no matter what becomes of our polluted names but lord what will thy do to thy great name when we pray that god's name may be glorified we make a virtue and necessity for god will sanctify his own name whether we desire it or not i will be ex exalted among the heathens we're going to go on the book of psalm chapter 46 verse 10 be still and know that i am god I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. Now God wants them who persecute the church to seize their cruelty. But also they will, they will feel that God is too strong for them against whom they fight. We ask for, for that which we are sure shall be granted for when our Savior prayed. Father, glorify thy name. It was immediately answered. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Thy kingdom come. This, is, this petition has plainly a reference to the doctrine which Christ preached at this time, which John Baptist had preached before and which he afterwards sent his apostles out to preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of your father who is in heaven, the kingdom of the Messiah, this is at hand. Pray that it may come. We should turn the word we hear into prayer. Our hearts should echo to it. Those Christ promised, surely I come quickly. Our hearts should answer, even so come. Min ministers should pray over the word. When they preach the kingdom of God is at hand, they should pray, Father, thy kingdom come. What God has promised, we must pray for. For promises are given not to supersede but to quicken and encourage prayer. And when the accomplishment of the promise is near and at the door, when the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we should then pray for it the more earnestly. Thy kingdom come. As Daniel set his face to pray for the deliverance of Israel, when he understood that the time of it was at hand. We're going to go to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. That's in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 2. Now, for even though he was an excellent prophet, yet he daily increased in knowledge by the reading of the scriptures. 
We're going to go in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That's in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 11. We must patiently wait for the judgment of God, which will be revealed in his time, not our time, his time. It was the Jews' daily prayer to God, let him make his kingdom reign, let his redemption flourish, and let his Messiah come and deliver his people. Let thy kingdom come, let the gospel be preached to all and embraced by all, let all be brought to subscribe to the record God has given in his word concerning his son, in the gospel, well in the scriptures, because it's from the beginning of the book to the end of the book and to embrace him as their savior and server let the bounds of the gospel church be enlarged the kingdom of the world be made christ's kingdom and all men become subject to it and live as become their ch character thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven we pray that god's kingdom become we and others may be brought into obedience to all the law of and ordinances of it by this let it appear that christ's kingdom is come let god's will be done and by this let it appear that it is come as a kingdom of heaven let it introduce a heaven upon earth we make christ but a identifying prince if we call him king and do not do his will having prayed that he may rule us we pray that we may in everything be ruled by him. The thing prayed for, thy will be done. Lord, do what thou pleaseth with me and mine. We're going to go in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verse 18. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. That's in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verse 18. I refer myself to thee and am well satisfied that all thy counsel concerning me should be performed. In this sense, Christ prayed, not my will, but thy be done, thy will be done. It enables me to do what is pleasing to, to me. Give me that grace that is necessary to write to the right knowledge of thy will and an acceptable obedience to it. Let thy will be done carefully by me and others, not all, not our own will, the will of the flesh or the mind, not the will of men, but the will of God. We're going to go in the book of First Peter, chapter four, verse two, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's in the book of First Peter, chapter four, verse two. So much of this present life as remain yet to be passed over, much less Satan's will. We're going to go in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speak, speaketh a lie, he speaketh of him, his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 14. Meaning from the beginning of the world, for as soon as a man was made, the devil cast him headlong into death. That is, did not continue con con constantly or did not remain. This is in faithfulness and uprighteousness. That is, the devil did not remain in the manner in which he was created, even from the own head and from the own mind or disposition the author of it that we may neither dis neither displease god in anything we do nor be displeased at any time god does the pattern of it that it might be done on earth in this place of our trial and probation where our work must be done or it never will be done as it is done in heaven that place of rest and joy we pray that earth may be made more like heaven by the observ observance of God's will. This earth, which through the prevalence 
of Satan's will has become so near akin to hell and that saints may be made more like the holy angels in their devotion and obedience. We on earth, blessed be God, not yet under the earth. We pray for the living only, not for the dead that have gone down into silence. Give us this day our daily bread because our natural being is necessary to our spiritual well-being. In this world, therefore, after the things of God's glory, kingdom, and will, we, we pray for the necessary support and comfort of this present life, which are the gifts of God, and must be asked of him, bread for the daily, approaching for all the remind, remainders of our lives, bread for the time to come, for the bread of our being and substance that which is agreeable to our condition in the world. We're going to go into the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food covenant for me. Com I'm sorry. Feed me with food convenient for me. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 8. Food convenient for us and our families according to our rank and stations. Every word here has a lesson in it. We ask for bread that teaches us sobriety and temperance. We ask for bread, not dainties, not superfluities, that which is wholesome, though it be not nice. We ask for our bread that teaches us honesty and industry. We do not ask for the bread out of other people's mouths, not the bread of deceit. We're going to go in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 17. Bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 17. Not the, not the bread of idols. Not the bread of idleness. We're going to go in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 27. So looketh well to the way of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 27. But the bread honestly gotten. We, got, we, we ask for our daily bread, which teaches us not to take thought of the marvel. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the marvel, for the marvel shall be shall take the though shall so I'm sorry, let's start all over. Matthew six verse chapter six verse thirty four. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil therefore. That's in the book of Matthew chapter six verse thirty four. But con constantly to depend upon divine providence. As those that live from hand to mouth, we beg of God to give it to us, not sell it to us or lend it to us, but give it. The greatest of men must be beholden to the mercy of God for their daily bread. We pray, give it to us, not to me only, but to others in common with me. This teaches us charity and a compassionate concern for, poor, for the poor and needy. It imitates it imitates also that we ought to pray with our families we are we and our household eat together and therefore ought to pray together we pray that God would give us this day which teaches us to renew the desires of our souls towards God as the wants of our body our bodies are renewed as dully as the day comes we must pray to our Heavenly Father and reckon we could as well go a day without meat as without prayer and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is connected with the former and forgive intimating that unless our sins are pardoned, we can have we can have no comfort in life or the support of it. Our daily bread does but feed us as lambs for the slaughter. Our daily bread does but feed us lamb for the slaughter, if our sins be not pardoned. 
it imitates likewise that we I'm sorry it intimates likewise that we must pray for daily pardon as dully as we pray for daily bread he that is washed neither to wash his feet here we have a petition father in heaven forgive us our debts our debts to thee our sins are our debts there is a debt of duty which as creatures we owe to our creator we do not pray to be discharged from that but upon the non-payment of that there arise a debt a punishment in default of obedience to the will of god we become obnoxious to the wrath of god and for not observing the precepts of the law we stand obliged to the penalties a debtor is liable to process so are we a malefactor is a debtor to the law so are we our hearts desired and prayer to our heavenly father every day should be that he would forgive us our debts that the obligation to punishment may be concealed and vacated that we may not come into a condemnation that we may be discharged and have the comfort of it in suing suing out the pardon of our sins the great plea we have to rely upon is the sanctification that was made to the just to the justice of god for the sin of men by the dying of the lord jesus our surety or rather bail to to the action that the undertook that undertook our discharge an argument to enforce this petition as we forgive our debtors this is not a plea of merit but a plea of grace those that come to god for the for the forgiveness of their sins against him must make conscience of forgiveness forgiving those who have offended us as well unless we curse ourselves when we say the lord's prayer our duty is to forgive our debtors as to debt of money we must not be rigorous and severe in ex exacting them from those that cannot pay them without ruining themselves and their families but this means debt of injury or debtors are those that trespass against us that smite us we're going to go in the book of matthews chapter 5 verse 39 and 40 but i say unto you that ye resist not evil but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek turn to him the other also and if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat let him have thy cloak also that's in the book of matthews chapter 5 verse 39 and 40 and in strictness of law might be perse persecuted for it we must forbear and forgive and forget the affronts upon put upon us and the wrong done us and this is a moral qualification for pardon and peace it encouraged to hope that god will forgive us for it for if there be in us this gracious disposition it is wrong of god and therefore is a perfect greatly and trans transcendently in himself it will be uh, evident to us that he has forgiven us having wrought in us the conditions of forgiveness and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil this petition is expressed negatively lead us not into temptation having prayed that the guilt of sin may be removed we pray as it is fit that we may never return again to folly that we may not be tempted to it it is not as if god tempt, tempted any to sin but lord do not let satan loose upon us uh, us chained up that roaring lion for he is subtile and spiteful lord do not leave us to ourselves we're gonna go in the book of psalm chapter 19 verse 13 keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin let them not have adopt a dominion over me then shall i be upright and i shall be innocent from the great transgression now presumptuous sin meaning sin which are done purposely and from malice if we if you suppress my wicked affection by your holy spirit for we are very weak lord do not lace 
stumbling blocks and snares before us, nor put us into circumstances that may be an occasion of falling. Temptations are to be prayed against both because of the discomfort and trouble of them and because the danger we are in of being overcome by them and the guilt and grief that then follow positively but deliver us from evil from the evil ones the devil the tempter keep us that either we may not be assaulted by him or we may not be, be overcome by those assaults or from the evil being sin the worst of evil and evil and only evil that evil thing which god hates and which satan tempts men to and destroy them by lord deliver us from the evil of the world the corruption that is in the world through lust from the evil of every condition in the world from the evil of death from the sting of death which is sin deliver us from ourselves from our own evil hearts deliver us from evil men that they may not be a snare to us nor we a prey to them the conclusion for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen so some refer this to david's praise to god in the book of first chronicles chapter 2 verse 11 thine o lord is the greatness of the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine thine is the kingdom o lord and thou art exalted as head over all that's in the book of first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 thine o lord is the greatest the greatness it is a form of plea to enforce the foregoing petitions it is our duty to plead with god in prayer to fill our mouth with argument we're gonna go on the book of job chapter 23 verse 4 i would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments that's in the book of job chapter 23 verse 4 not to move god but to affect ourselves to encourage the faith to excite our warmth or intensity of feeling and to evidence both now the best plea in prayer are those that are taken from god himself and from that which he has made known of himself we must wrestle with god in his own strength both as the, the, the nature of our pleas and the urging of them the plea here has special reference to the first three petitions father in heaven thy kingdom come for thy is the kingdom and thy will be done for thy is the power hallowed be thy name for thy is the glory and as to our own particular errands these are encouraging thy is the kingdom thou has the, the government of the world and the protection of the saints thy will willing subjects in it god gives and saves like a king thy is the power to maintain and support thy kingdom and to make good all thy in, in engagements to thy people thy is the glory as the end of all that which is given to and done for the saints in answer to their prayer for their praise waited for him this this is a matter of comfort and holy confidence in prayer it is a form of praise and thanksgiving the best pleading with god is praising of him it is the way to abstain further mercies as it qualifies us to receive it in all our addresses to god it is fit that praise should have a considerable share for praise becometh the saints we we are to be our god for a name and for a praise it is just and equal we praise god and give him glory not because he needed he is praised by a world of angel but because he deserves it and it is our duty to give him glory in compliance with his design and revealing himself to us praise is the work and happiness of heaven and all that would go to heaven thereafter must begin their heaven now how full this praise is to god the kingdom and the power and the glory it is all thine it becomes us to to be copious in praising god a true saint never thinks he can speak honorably enough to god here there shall be a gracious fluence and this forever ascribe glory to god forever intimates and acknowledgement 
that it is eternally due and in earnest desire to be eternally doing it with angels and saints above. We're going to go in the book of Psalm chapter 71 verse 14. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. That's in the book of Psalm chapter 71 verse 14. Lastly, to all this we are taught to affix our amen. So be it. God's amen is a grant. It shall be. It shall be. So our amen is only some, a summary desire. Our it shall be. Let it be. Let it be so. It is the token of our desire and assurance to be heard that we say amen. Amen refers to every petition going before and thus in compassion to our infirmities. We are taught to knit up the whole in one word and so so to gather up in the general what we have lost and let slip in the particular. It is good to conclude the gospel duties with some warmth and vigor that we may go from them with a sweet savior upon our spirit. It was of old the practice of good people to say amen audibly at the end of every prayer and it is a commendable practice provided it be done with understanding as the apostle directs. We're going to go on the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 16. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that complieth, that, that occupieth the room from the unlearned say amen at thy giving of things, seeing he understandeth not what thou say. That's in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 16. Another reason seeing that the whole congregation must agree with him that speak and also witness this agreement. How will they give their assent or agreement who know not what is spoken? So that's why you need to go get witness and get your Bible. And when a person speak, they got to you got to witness that and say, you know, verify that which is spoken of and show you let them show you that which is written in the Bible. Along without any consider, consideration of the hearers, he that sit as a private man, so that one utter the prayers and all the company answered, Amen. And uprightly with life and like li li liveliness and inward expression answerable to that outward expression of desire and confidence. Most of the petition in the Lord's Prayer have been commonly used by the Jews in their devotion or words to the same effect but that clause in the fifth petition as we forgive our debtors was perfectly new and therefore our savior here shows for what reason he added it not with any personal reflection upon the complaining a lot to dispute or disagree argumentative and ill nature of the men of that generation though there was cause enough for it but only from the necessity and importance of the things itself. God in forgiving us has a particular peculiar respect to our forgiving those that have injured us. And therefore, when we pray for the pardon, we must mention our making conscious of that duty, not only to remind ourselves of it, but to bind ourselves to it. We're going to go in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, to 25 therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants and when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents but for as much as he had not to pay his lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made that's in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 23 through 25. Selfish, na selfish nature is law to comply with this, and therefore it is here inculcated. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So always remember that. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. 
in a promise, if ye forgive, your heavenly Father will also forgive. Not as if this were the only condition required. There must be repentance and faith and new ob obedience. But as as were other graces are in truth, there will be this. So this will be a good evidence of the sincerity of our other graces. He that relents towards his brother thereby shows that he repents towards his God. Those which is which in the prayer are called depths are here called trespasses, depths of injury, wrong done to us in our body, goods, and reputation. Trespasses in any serving to lessen the seriousness of an offense. To lessen the seriousness of an offense. Terms for offenses, stumbles, slips, falls. It is a good evidence and a good help of our forgiving others to call the injuries done us by a mollifying excusing name accusing name call them not treason but trespasses not willing not willful injuries but casual forgetting peradventure and it was an oversight we're going to go in the book of Genesis chapter 43 verse 12 and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought against in the mouth of your sacks carry it again in your hand preadventure and it was an oversight that's in the book of Genesis chapter 43 verse 12 when we are in need of danger God does not forbid us to use honest means to better our estate and condition therefore make the best of it we must forgive as we hope to be forgiven and therefore must not only bear no malice nor mediate revenge, but must not upbraid our brother with the injuries he has done us, nor rejoice in any hurt that befalls him, befalls him, but must be ready to help him and do him good. And if he repent and desires to be friends again, we must be free and familiar with him as before. And threatening, but if in a in a threatening, but if you forgive not those that have injured you, that is a bad sign. You have not the other requisite condition, but are altogether unqualified for pardon. And therefore, your father, whom you call father, and whom as a father offers you his grace upon reasonable terms will nevertheless not forgive you and if others grace be sincere and yet you be defective greatly in forgiving you cannot expect the comfort of your pardon but to have your spirit brought down by some affliction or other to comply with this duty those who would have found mercy with God must show mercy to their brethren. No can we expect that he should stretch out the hands of his favor to us unless we lift up to him pure hands with our wrath. We're going to go on the book of First Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's in the book of First Timothy, chapter 2, verse 8. He has spoken of the person for whom we must pray. And now he teaches that the difference of places is taken away. For, it, for in time past, only one nation and in one certain place came together, came together to the public service. But now churches or congregations are gathered together everywhere, orderly and decently. And men come together to serve God publicly and with common prayer. Neither must we strive for the nation or for the purification of the body or for the place, but for the mind to have it clean, clear from all offense and full of sure trust and confidence. He talks of the signs of the time of the things itself, the lifting up of hands for the calling upon God without the grief and offense of the mind which hinders us from calling upon God with a good conscience. Doubting which is against faith. We're going to go in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 6. But let him act in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, 
driven with the wind and tossed. That's in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 6. If we pray in anger, we have reason to fear God. We'll, ang- we'll answer in anger. It has been said, prayer made in wrath are written in gold. What reason is it that God should forgive us the talents we are indebted to to him if we forgive not our brethren the pence they are indebted to us? Christ came into the world as a great peacemaker. That's why no Jesus, no peace. And not only to reconcile us to God, but one to another. And in this, we must comply with Christ. It is a great presumption and of dangerous consequences for any to make a light matter of that which Christ here lays such a stress upon. Men's passion shall not frustrate God's word. Now, that concludes this third part of the segment, the Sermon on the Mount, Christ Teaches on Prayer. We will continue tomorrow with part four of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ Jesus Teaching on Fasting. In Christ Jesus' name, may God be the glory as I walk, live, and pray in your image and likeness, the fruit of the Spirit. I come in love and leave in peace, grace and peace, and much love and blessings to you and your family. Have a blessed day to all the saints, my brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. Amen.